Hello again, and welcome to Astronomy Toronto. My name is Randy Atwood. Astronomy Toronto is produced by the Toronto Centre of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. This is an organization of both amateur and professional astronomers who meet regularly at the McLaughlin Planetarium and get out underneath the sky together to observe the stars. On this edition of Astronomy Toronto, we're going to be talking and looking at astro amateur astronomy. My guest is one of Toronto's most experienced amateur astronomers and a member of the Toronto Centre, Michael Watson. And Michael, thanks very much for coming on Astronomy Toronto today. As usual, it's a pleasure to be here. I guess the first question, Michael, is what is an amateur astronomer? Well, really, Randy, an amateur astronomer is anyone who enjoys getting out and looking up into the night sky and uh, looking at the stars, the moon, whether with a telescope or just with the naked eye. What, uh, what do amateurs uh, do mainly? Depends on your level of sophistication, but right from the beginning, an amateur just gets out, looks up with the, with the, the unaided eye, looks at the stars. Uh, organizations get together and have star parties uh, by telescopes and look at the stars with telescopes, visit observatories, planetariums, and that sort of thing. So really you have different levels of, of serious. Very much. Just like any other hobby. Very much. All right, let's say uh, someone out there was interested in getting uh, into amateur astronomy. Uh, what are some of the things that they would do to get started? Probably one of the, the first things, and, and I think that this is always a very good idea, is to join an astronomy club. And of course, the, the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, as the largest national astronomical organization in the world, is, is a natural. Uh, that's one of the, uh, the good things to do to, to start to meet amateur astronomers. Apart from that, what you really want to do is, uh, is read a little bit. Uh, you can uh, go out and buy uh, uh, something simple like uh, a planisphere here, which if you're interested in going out and observing, will um, allow you to find out where the stars are at night. You can get a little more sophisticated and, uh, and get uh, a star atlas, such as Norton Star Atlas, which is one of the, the favorites of amateur astronomers. And um, really keeping, uh, keeping current, for example, by um, uh, subscribing to uh, Astronomy Magazine, Sky and Telescope is one of the, the uh, most popular in the world, and uh, that sort of thing. And with a little bit of, um, uh, of reading and so on, one can become really quite knowledgeable in a fairly short period of time. All right, so there's, there's various degrees of uh, astronomy. That is, uh, do you have to... Uh, one of the questions is, well, do I have to have a telescope to be an amateur astronomer? And the, the answer is no, isn't it? Well, that's right. A lot of people think that you need a telescope, and if you don't have one, you're not an amateur astronomer. But that's not true. The very first optical instrument you use, just your eye. And that's all. And there's a lot of things that you can see with just Absolutely. your eye. Absolutely. Uh, if uh, we're going to get into uh, higher optics, uh, many of the people who start out uh, into amateur astronomy, they usually go out and buy a good pair of uh, 7 by 50 or 7 by 35 binoculars. Why is uh, it important to start low uh, with a pair of binoculars? Well, it, it's always seemed to me that it's a mistake to buy a, a telescope right at the beginning because you really don't know the sky and you don't know what you're looking at. It's very frustrating trying to point a telescope if you've never really looked at the stars before. And a pair of binoculars such as these uh, really uh, are a perfect way to, uh, to start looking at the sky. You get nice wide uh, fields of view. You're not spending an enormous amount of money, which I think is important for a beginning amateur astronomer. And as well with a good quality pair of binoculars, the star images are very nice. You can sweep the sky. You can just lie out on your back or in a chaise lounge and under the night sky and sweep the sky. And you can see a surprising amount if you get out of the city into a nice dark sky. Well, let's take a look at uh, some of the things we can see I guess the easiest object that one can see in the sky, Michael, is, uh, is the moon. Why is, uh, why is that a good place to start? Well, I, I guess probably every amateur astronomer takes a look at the, uh, at the moon. That's the very first object we look at. One of the reasons is that you can see it uh, almost every night of the month, and you can see it from the light polluted city as well as from the beautiful dark country. And uh, we see a, a photograph here of an almost full moon uh, taken with a small telescope. And uh, it's really quite easy to, uh, to pick out various features on the moon. When, uh, it's an exciting object. There are some uh, other things that are very easy to see. Uh, I think nine of, out of ten people who look up in the sky can, can see what's called the Big Dipper. And uh, the next slide we have is of uh, the Big Dipper, which is very easy to see from uh, our northern latitudes. Well, it is. It can be seen virtually all year round and is especially prominent in the spring and summer skies. Here we see a short exposure which shows the, the main stars of the Dipper. Actually, the Dipper is uh, only a small portion of the constellation of Ursa Major, the Great Bear, but it's one of the most familiar star patterns in the sky. There are some other familiar patterns. Uh, something that looks like a very small Dipper is the Pleiades. And this is a, a very beautiful object. 
Uh, it's in a constellation called Taurus. Tell us about the Pleiades. The Pleiades are very interesting and probably the most famous cluster of stars. They're all gravitationally bound together and they travel together through space. They were known to the ancients as the Seven Sisters and we can see at least seven stars and sometimes with good eyes and in a dark sky, eight of them. An interesting thing about the Pleiades is that they span at a distance or a diameter in the sky about equal to the full moon and something that's of special interest to astronomers uh, this coming November is that as seen from the Earth, Halley's Comet will appear to pass just about two or three moon diameters south of the Pleiades on November 17th and we're all looking forward to that. That view of the Pleiades is uh, what you'd see uh, just looking through a pair of binoculars. Uh, it's very easy to see a lot of the planets. There are five planets that you can see with your naked eye. And our next shot is uh, a view last summer of Jupiter. That's Jupiter, that very bright object in the center in the southern Milky Way, uh, in the summer Milky Way towards the southern sky. That was taken uh, near Belleville, a very short exposure, and, uh, and it shows uh, Jupiter as being the brightest object uh, right in the Milky Way. Uh, something that uh, everyone in the summertime uh, may have noticed uh, looking up at the night sky is that every now and then you see a bright flash. It uh, looks like a, a star falling from the sky or what we call a shooting star, and a lot of people call them meteors. Uh, those are quite interesting. And here's another interesting thing you can see, too. It's called the aurora. Tell me about the aurora. Well, the aurora borealis, which in Latin simply means a northern dawn, is uh, really an effect produced by charged particles from the sun uh, interacting with the Earth's atmosphere and is best seen from uh, uh, fairly northern latitudes. But for example, from Muskoka, where these photographs were taken, you can see the aurora probably one out of every three nights. These are a couple of different views of the aurora, and they seem to shimmer and move around the sky. Uh, you can see the constellation of the W of Cassiopeia in this photograph, and they have different colors depending on whether it's oxygen or nitrogen or hydrogen with which these charged particles are interacting. And the colors, in fact, are to some extent visible to the naked eye. Now, you don't know exactly when there's going to be uh, a northern lights display, but one of the main things is it's very rare that you see a northern lights display from, uh, from the city. You generally have to be out in the, in the country to see it because you have to have dark skies. Well, the next logical step up from the naked eye and binoculars, once you're sure that you want to uh, invest a bit of money into amateur astronomy, is to get a telescope. And Michael, you have a, uh, your telescope here. Uh, tell us about the different type of telescopes that one can get. Well, really, uh, Randy, you can, you can buy telescopes for anything from $100 up to many thousands of dollars. And in order to get uh, you know, an, a nice view of the planets and the moon and so on, uh, views that won't be disappointing, it's probably necessary to spend on the order of two or three hundred dollars. You don't have to go for the, uh, the giant behemoths at the beginning. You know, that's really for the future. This, I use a smaller telescope for ten years before I, I got this uh, telescope. There are different, re different kinds of telescopes. Refractors, which use lenses to gather the light. Reflecting telescopes, which use mirrors. And then this kind of telescope, which is called a schmidt cassegrain which is a a little more sophisticated and uses both a lens in the front and a mirror to collect the light. And really what a telescope does, it doesn't, its primary function as, as we know isn't to magnify but rather to collect the light and make the faint objects in the sky brighter. That's right, they're often called light buckets. That's exactly, uh, that's exactly what they are. They're collecting the light from these faint objects. And these are, these are interesting. It's, it, the light travels several, wit, several times down the length, so it's more, like a, it's more like it's compact. It's a smaller telescope than uh, what you might be used to, the long white tubes. Well, that's right. Uh, everybody uh, has the stereotypical image of a long white tube, but these are folded in very much the same way as uh, people who are watching and who are familiar with mirror lenses for cameras. It's exactly the same principle. We have a few uh, slides of things that you can see with a telescope, and the first one here uh, is, what do we see there? Well, we have a couple of photographs of the moon uh, taken actually through this uh, telescope uh, sitting behind us, some magnified views taken with uh, eyepieces right to, and attaching the camera right to the back of the uh, telescope. We can see some mountains and uh, craters and the very flat, what are called maria or seas, which are the flat volcanic plains. Here we see a view in the more rugged part of the moon with some very large impact craters caused by meteors. Uh, sometimes we have smaller craters, as you see on the left, superimposed onto the larger ones, which means that those uh, uh, meteors uh, fell uh, probably several hundred thousand years later. And this is the kind of view that you can get every night with the moon when the moon is in the sky. Just, just the other night I spent a uh, half an hour just soaking up all the things that you can see on a clear evening with a telescope. It, pictures do not give you a very good uh, representation. They're, you usually see several times better images uh, with a telescope than uh, the, what the pictures show. 
Well, that's true, and especially if you spend a good deal of time, because the Earth's atmosphere is turbulent, and when you take a photograph at a moment in time, it may be too turbulent to get a good photograph, whereas if you're looking for several minutes, you'll at some point in time get a very clear view of whatever you're looking at. Uh, another thing that you can see with telescopes, uh, better than binoculars, is details on planets. And here is uh, the largest planet in our solar system, Jupiter. This is a photograph of Jupiter taken again through this telescope. It's a several second exposure. And uh, I think the interesting thing is that you can always see the planets much better than you can photograph them. This is a, the kind of view that you would get probably through a $100 or $150 telescope. Uh, and with the more sophisticated telescopes, you can get super views showing all the cloud belts and bands on Jupiter and its moons and so on. This, is, uh, this has to be my favorite, the planet Saturn. Well, I think it's probably the favorite of everybody who looks through a telescope. This is very much like the kind of view you get with a telescope such as the one that, that uh, is sitting here. And you can see the, uh, at least two rings of Saturn. You can see the ball of the planet plus clouds on its surface and so on. It's a thrilling sight every time we look at it. Now, how big of a telescope do you need to see the rings at all? A very small telescope. Again, a $150 to $200 telescope will quite adequately show the ring. Of course, as soon as you, uh, as the first time you see Saturn with a, a smaller telescope, you're, wanting, you're going to want to get a bigger one because the view is so spectacular. Now, how many planets can we see uh, with, say, a telescope like this? Well, actually, this telescope theoretically is capable of seeing all the planets. I haven't yet seen Pluto with it, but it can certainly see all of the planets too, and including Uranus and Neptune. Uh, Pluto is, is almost too faint to be seen with it, but theoretically I should be able to see it with this telescope. Beyond the planets, we have uh, what are called deep sky objects. And I think in the next slide, we'll see one of those deep sky objects, a globular star cluster. What are, what are these things, Michael? Well, deep sky objects basically are objects that are outside our solar system, and they include star clusters, such as the Pleiades, which is an open star cluster, more densely packed star clusters, such as this globular cluster in the constellation Hercules. We have galaxies, which are located many millions of light years away. And we have uh, bright, uh, what we call diffuse nebulae, which are really clouds of glowing gas, which we can see in the sky. Those are the so-called deep sky objects. And those are the objects that have to be seen in a very dark sky. You can't see them very well, if at all, from the city. Now, looking at these photographs, and we've been talking about looking through the telescope with the naked eye and comparing them to photographs, what are the differences between the two? Well, there are a couple of differences. One which shows up a little bit here, I think, in that previous photograph, was that you really can't see colors very well with your naked eye. And that is simply because the light-sensitive photoreceptors in your eye are not very sensitive to color, whereas the photographic film is. And in that last photograph, which we saw of uh, an open star cluster, that the view that you see through a telescope will look very much like that, except the colors. You won't see the colors. How do, you, how do you know where to look in the sky? Because obviously you, you cannot see these star clusters with your naked eye. How do you know where to point the telescope? It's not uh, very hard. One of the things you do, and, and really the first thing that you have to do even before you get a telescope, is get a good set of star charts, such as the one I was showing before, Norton Star Atlas, or a better set of charts which shows more detail. Simply find the objects, and then using the telescope, either binoculars or a little finder scope right on the telescope, it's quite easy to pick them out in the telescope, and then direct the telescope to the right part of the sky. It's not that hard. It takes a little practice, but within a couple of months, someone using a telescope and a good star chart should be able to do it quite easily. Well, you've told us that some of these photographs uh, are taken with this telescope. Uh, what are we looking at when we're taking uh, photographs of, say, something like this? Uh, what's involved? This is a photograph, uh, a five-minute exposure of one of the famous objects in the sky, the Orion Nebula. The basic problem in, in photography is that the objects are very faint and therefore require long exposures. And by long exposures, we generally mean somewhere between one minute and one hour. But then the problem of the Earth's rotation comes into effect. And because if we simply put a, a camera point at the sky, the following happens. And we'll see this on the next photograph. Uh, what happens is we get star trails. Here I just turned the telescope motor off for one minute and the stars trailed. What it means is that we have to put an electric motor on the telescope to turn the telescope at precisely one revolution per day to counteract very precisely the rotation of the Earth. Essentially what we're doing is we're keeping the telescope pointed very precisely in one direction in the sky so as to allow us to build up the light on the film. That's the central problem of astrophotography, and it is quite complicated and takes a long time, many years, to become a good astrophotographer. And that is why so much equipment has to be built on the, to the telescope so that you can spot a single star 
and keep a set of crosshairs right on that star. Well, that, that's right, and uh, we'll see in, uh, in the next view a photograph of the telescope as it is set up for astrophotography. And it has um, uh, a good deal of, uh, of equipment uh, on it. Uh, I think what we see here is um, a photograph of the uh, Summer Triangle, uh, a short five-minute exposure showing the three bright stars, which are, are quite familiar to uh, people who are out in the summer sky. And we increase the exposures. That's a five-minute exposure. Uh, the next photograph we see increases the exposure to about 10 minutes, and we start to see more stars. Then final exposure is 15 minutes, and uh, if we can see it, we see that uh, the Milky Way, in fact, runs right through the middle. So I think this is a, a good lesson and a good demonstration of the fact that as you increase the exposure, you get more and more stars, and you can go fainter and fainter. And uh, really, we can go up to uh, you know, a good hour-long photograph uh, in order to uh, you know, go really deep and really get faint stars and so on. Are you limited to the amount of time you can, uh, you know, take a, can you take a one, two, three hour exposure? Well, that's, it, it depends on where you are. If you're in a very, very dark sky, for example, the middle of Arizona or Australia where the sky is really black and there's no light pollution from the city, you can go that long. But as we'll see a little later in the show, close to Toronto or any major city, even within an hour's drive, there's simply too much light pollution in the sky and it fogs the film or washes it out. Okay, in the next picture we have uh, an incredibly long exposure in a very dark sky. I think this is of the, the summer Milky Way, Michael, just a super shot. This is a photograph taken last summer in Muskoka, and it shows the famous Northern Cross, which is in the constellation of Cygnus the Swan, a very bright star on the left, which is Deneb, and just uh, below that, a little right on the left, there's a, a, a red ga uh, gas-like object, which is called the North American Nebula. We can also see the Milky Way uh, running right through the center of the, of the frame, and uh, that is in one of the brightest parts of the Milky Way in the summer sky. That's about a 20-minute exposure. One of the most beautiful things in, uh, in Cygnus is, uh, is this next shot, uh, a nebula that you've captured here, a, and it looks red. Well, it does look red. That is glowing hydrogen gas, which is actually illuminated by that bright star we see over to the right side. This is called the North American Nebula, and it appeared smaller in the previous photograph. Um, the North American Nebula is located about 600 light years away, so the light that's coming out of the film actually left that nebula about 600 years ago. And why are they red? Uh, red because of the fact that it is glowing hydrogen gas, and even though when we see it in binoculars of the naked eye, we don't see the color, the film actually does capture the true color of these objects. Now, what if we were to see the North American Nebula through this telescope? How would it look? You'd see a nice view in that you would see all sorts of gl uh, glowing gas, but you'd see it as white with the naked eye I, for the reason we explained earlier, and that is that your eye is not generally very sensitive to color at low light levels. One of the most uh, beautiful red nebulas that are in the sky, and so bright you can actually see it with your naked eye, is uh, the Orion Nebula. And Michael, this is an extraordinary picture that you took. This was taken actually in a very, in a very stiff wind, so the uh, stars appear to be a little bit blobby. But this was taken about uh, a month and a half ago in, uh, just outside London. It's a very short exposure because the Orion Nebula is a very bright object. And in fact, the brightest central part of it can be seen from the city. It's one of the few deep sky objects that can be seen from the city. Well, apart from using a telescope and taking photographs with a telescope, uh, there are some other things that uh, amateur astronomers like to do. And amateur astronomers, they have different interests in, in astronomy because there's so many things you can do. And one of the things that uh, we like to do is visit professional uh, observatories, installations that are run by uh, universities. And uh, we have uh, one of the largest in the world in the Toronto area. That's the David Dunlap Observatory just north of Toronto in Richmond Hill. That observatory has the largest telescope uh, in Canada, a 74-inch uh, telescope, which means it has a mirror that is 74 inches in diameter. Uh, this is a photograph that you took when you were up there recently, Randy, and uh, people can uh, call up to the observatory in the summer and, uh, and uh, go up to uh, visit the observatory on Saturday evenings, and it's a very short drive from Toronto. In the next shot, we have uh, an observatory uh, in Arizona, one that you visited uh, in during one of your travels. A few years ago, uh, I was down in Arizona. Just outside Tucson is one of the great national observatories of the United States called Kitt Peak National Observatory. And it has several telescopes uh, on the peak of this observatory. And uh, I think we can, uh, we can see some of them. Uh, it includes the, uh, the great, uh, what's called the Mayel Reflector, which is a four meter telescope, a very large telescope there, which is a beautiful instrument that's doing excellent work. Uh, we also see a very unusual telescope called the McMath Solar Telescope. 
and the sunlight actually goes down that tube very deep, several, uh, several hundred meters into the ground in order to form an image of the sun. It's a very exciting place to visit. And again, the public uh, can go up and take a look at these uh, observatories. And that's one of the interesting things, too, is that there are a lot of professional astronomers who uh, are part of the, uh, the astronomy club. And it's very interesting. We have a lot of professional astronomers talking to us at our meetings, and we get caught up on the latest work. I think that's one of the exciting things about our society in particular is that it's, uh, it's not very many astronomy clubs around the world that uh, consist of both professionals and amateurs, and that's one of the things that, that uh, we really enjoy about the RASC. Another thing uh, that one can do if one decides to travel is uh, see eclipses of the sun. And Michael, you and I have seen several total eclipses of the sun. Most recently, uh, this eclipse here seen in New Guinea in November. Maybe some of the uh, people uh, ha have heard about the total solar eclipses. And uh, we keep telling them that they're incredibly beautiful to see. Total solar eclipse is really, it's considered by anybody who has seen one, to be the most spectacular of all natural phenomena. And there are two photographs here taken of the November eclipse when we were, as you say, in Papua New Guinea. It is only during a total eclipse of the sun that one can see the faint solar atmosphere or corona. And we see that uh, uh, really surrounding the darkened disk of the, of the moon, which is blocking out the bright disk of the sun in this photograph. They are incredibly exciting to see. Unfortunately, in Canada, we don't get to see another one this century. But uh, for those people who are interested in traveling at a short distance to see one in July of 1991, there's going to be an extraordinarily long eclipse visible from Mexico. Uh, and I think that there are going to be thousands of people, both uh, astronomers and people who don't, at least at this point in time, consider themselves to be astronomers who will be interested in going to see that eclipse. One of the things we've been talking about uh, problem-wise is light pollution, Michael. And uh, how serious a problem is that for an amateur astronomer? Unfortunately, it is a serious problem, and it's becoming an increasingly serious problem. It used to be back at the beginning of the century that you could see the Milky Way from downtown Toronto. Now it's the case that even from Richmond Hill, from the David Dunlap Observatory, it's very difficult to see the Milky Way. Uh, light pollution is a real problem, not only for people sitting in, 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 in cities, but uh, also from the country. This photograph was taken uh, uh, about an hour's drive outside of Toronto, and this is a very short exposure, only about four minutes, but it shows the great glow uh, in the southern sky from the city of Toronto, and I was really surprised that with a short exposure such as this, the photograph is close to being ruined because of the light pollution. It's not because the stars aren't there. Be of course they are. It's just that there's so much light from the city, and that's why it's, it's difficult sometimes to convince people, but you just have to get out of the city to see a dark sky. Uh, we're talking about the uh, earlier the relationship between amateur astronomers and professional astronomers, and there are many scientific contributions that amateurs like you and I can make, and it's very surprising uh, to hear about, say, the, one of the amateur astronomers in Ottawa who has discovered four comets, and uh, it's, there are people, amateurs, who do look for comets, and when they discover them, they're named after them, isn't, isn't that right? Well, that's right. Rolf Meyer of the Ottawa Center of our society is considered uh, North America's greatest living comet discoverer. And he's uh, just a young fellow like us, and he's been at it for a few years, and he has discovered four of them. And that's one contribution that amateurs can make, because professionals don't have the time or the equipment, because it's in such great demand, to be searching the skies for comets. And that's just one example of things that amateurs can do to assist professional astronomy. Now, we're talking in the order of several hundred hours of telescope time sweeping the skies looking for something that no one has ever seen before. Very much, that's right. It takes a long time. There's a, another thing that uh, amateurs can do and that is uh, make uh, observations of stars that vary in brightness. Why is that important for professional astronomers? Well, it, uh, it's, a, it's an interesting fact, and a lot of people aren't aware of this, but most stars in the, st in the sky actually do vary in brightness on a, on a periodic basis. And the, the study of the, uh, of the variation of, those, uh, of the light from those stars is very important for astrophysics to enable professional astronomers to understand the way stars work, the way they're born, the way they live out their lives, and the way they die. And the study of variable stars, as they're called, is extremely important. Again, because there's so many thousands of them in the sky, the professionals don't have time to study them and follow their light curves and measure them. And that's what amateurs can do, and they do extremely well. There's also uh, an international network being set up now for the observations of Halley's Comet in 1986. And amateur astronomers all around the world are preparing their uh, notebooks and their equipment, standardizing it, uh, I guess you could say, so that when the comet comes, there'll be a network all around the world so that at least uh, there will be several hundred amateur astronomers observing the comet at the same time. 
so that when there's always nighttime on, on either side of the world, you'll be able to see it. That should be very exciting once uh, all that information is sent into the professionals. Well, it will be of use to the professionals. Again, for one of the reasons is that the large telescopes don't have enough observing time to be able to observe the comet. And with this network of amateurs, we'll be able to cover it uh, every hour of every day that the comet is near the Earth and the Sun. Uh, something that you and I have done, Michael, is, uh, is chase grazes or occultations of, uh, of stars by the moon. Tell us uh, about that. This is one of the uh, more, I suppose, esoteric uh, things that, that amateurs can do. As the moon moves in its orbit around the Earth, it periodically passes in front of stars, and the stars will suddenly disappear as the moon moves over the star. It is, in fact, the most nearly instantaneous phenomenon that the human eye can observe. By timing these uh, occurrences and measuring our positions on the, on the Earth e extremely accurately, we can help professional astronomers to determine a number of things, including continental drift, uh, in improvements to the moon's orbit, improvements to the known positions of the stars, and so on. That's something that really has grown up in the last 20 years, and uh, especially in North America, amateurs are involved in that, and we're quite heavily involved in it. Well, in summary, Michael, uh, if one of our viewers out there is interested in becoming an amateur astronomer or looking into it, what would your uh, advice be for them? Well, going back to really what we said at the beginning of the show, the first thing is to get in touch with amateur astronomers and to join an astronomy club. And uh, amateurs in the Toronto area uh, should uh, get in touch with the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, either the national headquarters uh, in Toronto or at the McLaughlin Planetarium, which is the headquarters of the Toronto Centre. And uh, you'll meet a lot of people who have like interests and certainly learn a lot about astronomy. And I really think that's the way to start. And uh, the Toronto Centre does have many telescopes, like Michael's here, uh, available for members to get a look through at uh, public star parties. And uh, we, in summary, we have several lectures a month at the planetarium. Uh, we have expeditions set up uh, to go outside of the city. And we're even planning to have some public star nights uh, during the summer. So uh, for me, Randy Atwood, and uh, my friend here, Michael Watson, I'd like to thank you for watching Astronomy Toronto. Uh, clear skies, and hopefully you'll have a chance to go out and uh, see the stars some night. Bye for now.